You're very welcome to the book show that invites you to get between the sheets. I'm Megan Scully and this is What's the Story? Today we have some more super guests. Author, editor and writing mentor Jamie O'Connell is a man who knows how to stimulate his readers. But did his book of the month do it for him? No, absolutely. It was just such an exhilarating read and it just took me from France to Africa to South America of these kind of crazy aviators who are just kind of flying around the globe. So, you know, dark winters are coming in and I'm just like... It was total escapism, so it's oh, a great read. Yeah. And we can fly again. <laughs> but more on that shortly. First, she likes big books and she cannot lie. And in it's good thing too. Brilliant <laughs> and beautiful bookworm, Trina McCarthy is here. You're very welcome. <laughs> I like big books and I can't, oh, that's good. I like that. <laughs> well, we had to give an extraordinary introduction to an extraordinary lady. <laughs> Thank you so much. Also today, Cullum Tobin's new book, The Magician, has just hit the shelves and he tells us about that and some of his other favourites. Oh, I'll tell you what's really good. If you're really looking for a good book, this is a book called Dreamers. And um, it's an account of the extraordinary revolution that took place in Munich in 1919. We'll have more from Cullum Tobin shortly. But first, Jamie, I've got a question for oh. you. If you're going on a first date and you had to give a book, what would it be and why? Um, I'd probably give them Tina Fey's Bossy Pants. I don't know if you've read it. It's a really, really funny book. And I, you know, if they got that, if they laughed at it, I'd be like, okay, we can, we can work Ooh, with that. She's really good. good. Yeah, yeah, she's really, really funny. Or maybe like The Alchemist or something, because I think like we'd probably Deep. have a kind of meeting of minds. So it'd be kind of the light and the, if they got that, we'd definitely, we're meant to be. Wow, interesting. So. Yeah. <laughs> They're actually two good books. Trina, what do you okay. think? Me? Oh my goodness, I would have to get uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Yes, <laughs> absolutely, John Gray, or, classic. Yes, or maybe a cookbook, uh, yeah, or maybe okay. the book I haven't written yet. Uh, do you remember there was The Domestic Goddess? I'm like the domestic, God help us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot cook, I cannot clean, but I like big books and I cannot lie. Well, that's the most important thing. And uh, I've actually been given cookbooks before as presents from you. Yeah, Would you not we, be a bit we, like, if someone gave me a cookbook, I'd be like, what are you insinuating? Am I going to be cooking all the dinners? No? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you get okay. in there, you show them what you want from the okay. beginning. That's, yeah. that's how I operate. Yeah. I also really like cookbooks for kind of decorating as well. I think they look oh. really good in the kitchen, you know, just kind of for Instagram. You know, yeah. you do decorate with books, don't you? Yes, all the time. Yeah, okay. But since we don't have CDs anymore, we don't, like your house needs books. It's kind of the one Absolutely. thing we have left. And I so. actually even like to colour code books to make them look really nice. You know, when there's like a, like a corner that you're not really sure what to do. I might not often read them, <laughs> some of the cookbooks, but they look really good. And it makes it, it look like I am a domestic goddess. Oh, well, that's it. And a few coffee table books. I have a few of those yes. at home that just, look, as you said, look good on the table. I couldn't even tell you what's inside in the pages. And I'm like, don't touch the good book. <laughs> that's yeah. the good book. Yeah. Do not touch it. And it's not a coaster. Do not put your tea <laughs> exactly. coffee down. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, there are some really great books there as well. But I think it's time we get on to our first book. All Antoine Dussaint Expiré, apologies to all our French viewers, <laughs> wants to do is to be a pilot. But flying is a dangerous dream and one that sets him at odds with his aristocratic background and the woman he loves. In the midst of his adventures, Antoine also begins to weave a children's story that is destined to touch the lives of millions of readers around the world. A story called The Little Prince. Fame and fortune may have finally found Antoine, but as a shadow of war begins to threaten Europe, he's left to wonder whether his greatest adventure is yet to come. It is The Prince of the Skies by Antonio Iturbe. Well, Jamie, tell us about it. Well, it just kind of opens up in the 1919, just after the First World War. And it's about these three aviators who've kind of been flying in the First World War. But like, these are planes like 1919, you can imagine it's like a can with wings. It's, it's, it's the most dangerous thing they're doing. They're, you know, so they start uh, working in civil aviation and it's their adventures kind of firstly conquering France in these planes and then moving yeah. on to like traveling, getting post from like Paris to uh, Spain and then on to Northern Africa, you know, in record times and their lives are so dangerous. And they, I don't know where these find these people, how they're even, they're mad. They're actually mad. You're reading going, <laughs> you're going to fly over the Andes in this thing. Like it's a bucket <laughs> and it's, it's kind of large scale. It's continent to continent and it's, it's a very exciting read. And I suppose the main character, Antoine, who, uh, is based on the writer. Uh, he's sort of amazing at aviation, but he is desperate in love. Like he just okay. picks the wrong <laughs> awful people all the time who treat him terribly. I'm okay. yeah. Yeah. So, is there kissing? There is kissing. Okay. Yeah. I love it. I'm kissing. <laughs> so but there's a lot of fighting. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. So no, like, he's he he first he falls in love with this French woman who's, you know, uh, kind of out of his league and but she eventually agrees to kind of uh, be engaged to him and then kind of warms off and then he's like writing these love letters to her for years it kind of reminds me of my days going off oh, those times you send a text to somebody and you shouldn't 
Uh, and then later on, he has a very sort of stormy relationship with this woman called Consuelo. Uh, oh, I love so, that And she's, every, she's everything you'd expect a okay. sort of fiery Consuelo to be, you know. So you kind of realise as he's going to these different countries, he's meeting people with different viewpoints and different philosophies on life. And gradually the book is forming in his mind over the course of the, the, the other book that we're actually reading. So uh, okay. it's a beautiful book. It's really, it's total adventure. And anyone who just wants to like, Get out of Ireland, because we've all been in Ireland for like two years mm. and just wants to experience kind of the wild west of yeah. our early aviation. Well, that's what I was wondering, because I guess the year we've had, we're only just kind of getting back into flying now in recent mm. months. So you were talking about there's a national crash, isn't it? So were you kind of like reading it going, <laughs> I haven't gotten on a plane in like 18 months and now I'm reading this book. Well, the danger actually was I, Wikipedia now. So I, because these are all real people in their lives, I was going, Oh, God, I just not because it's a long book. So I was like halfway through it going, well, let's see how this ends, you know, kind of a thing. Because <laughs> there's a lot of people around them who are dropping like flies, you know. So this guy, Jean, who's one of the main characters in it, he's one of Antoine's friends, who's like six foot three. He's a ladies man. He's twice as much as everyone else. And he'll go up in anything and fly over anywhere. And he's the first person to fly over the Andes in this <laughs> this plane that falls apart and it falls apart in the Andes and he like no. straps the plane together with like pieces of leather and rope and flies out of it like and back and his survives it's but that's actually happened that you know that's part and I think he won a major award in France for for what he'd done but uh he's very a bit of a heartthrob you know he's a bit of a leading oh, again man. you're sucking <laughs> me in with all that I'm so, like, mm, I uh, like there's a lot of testosterone of... in it yeah you definitely get a the sense that these are you know alpha men going hey. for it, yeah. So it's a great read. It's really what you talk about, I suppose there are Consuela as well and the love story. And then mm. I guess now we can say that, it, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to fly these days and, you know, it's yes. a little less risky. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. Like, I will never worry about like a little bit of turbulence on my, my Aer Lingus flight to Malaga or whatever, you know. It's, <laughs> this is like flying in a tin with a, like, a plank of wood across the back of it, you know? Well, Great absolutely. Read. It's an absolutely incredible book. fine size book as well. So I'd say you, you took some time reading this one. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh... Great read. Absolutely incredible. The Prince of the Skies. It's not the only book worth keeping an eye out for, though. Our author, Sinead Moriarty, has picked out some more titles that won't be left on the shelf for too long. Time now for the Eason Top Picks of Best Books to Screen Adaptation. First up, we have Shadow and Bone by Israeli-American writer Lee Bardugo. This is a young adult fantasy novel it's sweeping and it's sultry and there's lots in here. Next up is Dune. Dune by Frank Herbert. This was written over 50 years ago and is still considered one of the greatest science fiction novels ever written. Nomadland by Jessica Bruder. It's been made into a series starring Frances McDormand. It talks about the dark underbelly of the American economy and how so many people fall through the cracks and are ending up homeless. Pulitzer Prize winner, The Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead. Oprah and Obama have both praised this book. It's about racism in America. It's about the horrors that the blacks have faced over the centuries. And it's an absolutely unbelievably fascinating story. Bridgerton by Julia Quinn. The Netflix series of this book got me through lockdown. It's set in 1815 and it's about the Duke and his court and all the shenanigans that go on. Quentin Tarantino has written the book after the movie, which is quite unusual. So this book, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, was written after his award-winning movie was released. There's blood, there's guts, there's passion, there's affairs, there's movies, it's got everything. Arsene Lupin by Maurice Leblanc. This was turned into a Netflix series. Lupin is a gentleman thief, he is the Robin Hood. He steals from the rich to give to the poor. This is Daisy Jones and the Six, written by Taylor Jenkins Reid. It's about Daisy Jones and the Six, a famous, iconic rock group, their fabulous, sexy main singer, and why they all fell apart. So now we have Leanne Moriarty, my namesake, and her book is called Nine Perfect Strangers. Amazingly, these nine perfect strangers end up in a luxury resort and they get locked in. And all of their secrets and all of their lies and all the things they've been trying to hide from everybody come out. And finally, we have The Woman in the Window, which is now a major movie, described by Stephen King as unputdownable. This book is about a woman who spends her life looking at her window at her neighbours until one night she witnesses something absolutely horrific. And there we have it, the top picks from Eason of books to screen adaptations. 
Trina, I have to ask you now, before we get on to the next book, what is your favourite book of all time, if you had to pick one? Oh, my goodness, the Bible, obviously. And, uh, <laughs> love it. Um, whatever book I'm currently reading, I really love. I really get yeah. into it. I get very immersed. I, you know, I like the books that you'll be asking me about shortly. This is why I'm wearing a parachute. Um, and I really like Quitlet, weirdly. Um, it's like a, a genre now. And it's basically people that have given up either alcohol or drugs or something like that and how they've turned their lives around. But I really like the stories where they're doing like kind of crazy things. I quite like that. There's a great book, Blackout, by a girl called uh, Sarah, Sarah Hopola, who was a magazine editor, beauty editor, and she travelled all the way around the world and used to go to lots of fancy dinners and things. And uh, yeah, I could relate to a lot of what <laughs> she did in it. And it made me feel like, oh my goodness, I'm not the only one who's like this. And that's what I love about a book, that it just makes me... There's somebody worse, worse off than me sometimes, and that's what I love about a book. Oh, you can't beat something that's very relatable and you're reading it going, oh, yeah, that's me, yeah, I, I did that, I did that. I just won't tell my mother about that. <laughs> exactly. There's another one, a quick lit, uh, called The Accidental Soberista. It was just out this year from oh, Gale yes. Books. And because I always think of these books being like someone who has an alcohol problem. And yeah. then I read it, I'm going, oh, <laughs> it's a bit too close to home. I'm like, oh, I do a lot of that. But uh, And it seems to be a really kind of um, trend at the moment, isn't mm. there? For mm. these kind of like, uh, almost like confessionals, you know, like all these things that it's okay to say that you've done all these things. So I'm thinking the next book, my next favourite book will be the one that I write, probably called Party with McCarthy or something like that about oh, my own looking, experiences. Yeah. <laughs> looking for that, the Tales of Party McCarthy, I think will be the next bestseller. <laughs> Jamie, have you got a favourite book? I, that, I love a good cry, actually, I think, because it remains the day. I read that back in the 90s mm -hmm. and I always think, I always remember books that had me emotionally react some way. Do you know what I mean? Thank Usually you. it's crying. And uh, I just think that book... It's like 50 pages at the end of just like weeping, like <laughs> devastated. Oh, it's such a love story and a myth love. And to this day, I just think, I think it's just the ending of it. It's just so like, it just, every time I think of it, I can nearly bring tears to my eyes. You're making me emotional yeah. now as well. Yeah. I can feel the emotion. Yeah. I love love, you see. Yeah. And I love reading about love. And I, I do, I love it. It, yeah. puts, it puts me in good humour as well. Well, and that I was the worst piece of well. missed love. He gets to the end of his life and he realises, oh my goodness, this woman I worked with for 40 years is like, I missed her. Don't give away. Oh yeah, oh, don't give too much don't away. Don't give away oh, sorry. the plot. And then they live happily ever after. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> you have to read it. Yeah. Oh, it sounds incredible. Actually, I was in a charity shop the other day and I found To Kill a Mockingbird and I thought, you know what? Classic. Masterpiece. What, what yeah. A ma yeah, Masterpiece. That's exactly what it is. But sure, look, we could be here all day talking about our favourite books. It's time <laughs> to go on to our next book. After a tumultuous period in American politics, a new administration has just been sworn in. Secretary of State Ellen Adams is determined to do her duty for her country. But she is about to face a horrifying international threat. A young foreign service officer has received a baffling text from an anonymous source. Too late, she realises it is a hastily coded warning. Then a series of bus bombs devastates Europe, heralding the rise of a new rogue terrorist organisation who will stop at nothing in their efforts to develop their own nuclear arsenal. As Ellen unravels the damaging effects of the former presidency on international politics, she must also contemplate the unthinkable that the last president of the United States was more than just an ineffectual leader. Was he also a traitor to his country? It's State of Terror by Hillary Clinton and Louise Penny. I'm already gripped. Trina McCarthy, what a book. Can I just say, I was in a state of terror, which is the name of the book, when I was told this was the book I was going to read. I was like a political th mystery tr thriller. Oh, my goodness. Um, even though I've been a journalist for nearly 20 years, yeah. I write about the really important stuff, like what's the blackest mascara, the lipstick that is best worn under your mask <laughs> and things like that. I would not be known for things like political thrillers. I'm not even great with Irish politics, mm. never mind American politics. And obviously I'm aware of Hillary, who Hillary Clinton is. And I thumbed through like her memoirs and I was aware of Louise Penny, who's this Canadian um, award-winning uh, New York Times number one best-selling author. And I get the book and I'm like, you know, I was kind of being stubborn going, I really don't want to read this. It's not, my, it's out of my comfort zone. Um, and then I slowly kind of started to get into it and to like it because Ellen Adams, who's the Secretary of State, um, you have to remember, obviously, Hillary Clinton was the 67th. Look at me now with all my insider <laughs> knowledge of American <laughs> politics, was the 67th uh, Secretary of State. So she bases, obviously, the character on her and her kind of, you get kind of these like 
behind the scenes that only an insider would know about these things. So it kind of sucked me in there. And actually, speaking of sucking in, she actually, the character wears Spanx as well and drinks Chardonnay. So I was like, okay, <laughs> politicians can actually be quite normal as well. And I can relate to them as well. <laughs> so I started to, yeah, because in the beginning it was, was all very confusing, but I kept going and it's quite a big book as well. It goes all over the place from Afghanistan to Iran. You know, there's the, the Douglas Williams, who's the president and he's, um, He's hired Ellen Adams, the kind of the strong, independent woman that she is. Mm. Um, but she's actually his arch enemy. So that's really intriguing what's going on there. And as I said, I really get immersed in a book. So like today I'm wearing my power suit as well because <laughs> I'm a strong, independent woman that knows, knows so much about American politics now. But um, there was also some really interesting little things that I found out as well. Um, because like that, you were saying with your book that you would, you know, the urge to look on wiki, yeah. <laughs> Ellen Adams, um, her confidant and her best friend in the book is a lady called Betsy. Mm. And I remembered reading um, an interview with Hillary Clinton's real best friend who was called Betsy as well. So hey. actually, even though the book is all about, you know, an examination of um, terror and of hate, it's actually about courage and love as well, because Betsy is the is is Hillary Clinton's real best friend in real life. And she based the character Betsy, who's her advisor in the book on her because they met when they were in junior school together and they had a real love of books together. And sadly, Betsy died of breast cancer in 2019, I think it was. And so she asked her daughter and her husband, could she basically, you know, base this character on her real life best friend? So that wow. then absolutely drew me in and it gave her just such a lovely understanding to the character. She became way more real as well. And so even though it's a political thriller, don't let that put, put you off. It's a really, you know, as I said, it's about love. It's about courage. It's about, you know, overcoming obstacles. It's about strong, independent women. It's about, it, it's really like a, a you know, a, a guide for dummies, you know, that don't know about <laughs> politics. And like, I feel now that, you know, when I'm sitting around, I'll be like, yes, yeah, so you know, the last <laughs> secretary, you know, I've way more to talk about now before I'd be like, yeah, 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 yeah. Can we move on to talking about where'd you get your top? Or, you know, like, I, I feel like it's really kind of enhanced my, my conversation even and, and some of my vocabulary as well. And that's what's great about reading, isn't it? That's what's incredible about it. And I think I love what you said there because, you know, I think a lot of people would see a cover of a book and maybe just read the synopsis and think okay this yeah. is going to be really heavily political not my scene but after listening to you now I'm like oh wait a second yeah, you, there's so much more to this there and then you will be gripped because it just it goes all over the place and you're sometimes thinking is that really what's going on or not you know so it it's keeping you on the edge of your seat as well and you're kind of diving into their personal stories and sometimes you're going you know, am I getting this? And then and then there's a big twist, you know, and then there's something else coming down the line. It's honestly edge of the seat stuff. And I finished it and I'm so proud of myself. And, you know, I just, you know, the next time I meet Hillary now, I have to commend her on her, her <laughs> book whenever I'm hanging out with some American politics, you yeah. know, politicians even. Yeah. And I think we're going to be seeing you reporting outside Doll Era next. <laughs> you <laughs> your never <laughs> We will be looking forward to it. Cullum Tobin has been described as one of the best living authors and his new book, The Magician, a sweeping novel of unrequited love and exile, war and family has just hit the shops. I caught up with the literary great and I started by asking him about his 2009 novel, Brooklyn, which was adapted for film and nominated for three Academy Awards, Best Picture, Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Actress for Saoirse Ronan. How was it for you to see that adaptation on the big screen and then for it to become like critically acclaimed across the world? Brooklyn was one of those strange experiences where I sold the rights to a producer that I liked and trusted. She then behaved impeccably throughout. I mean, in other words, she got a great director, John Crowley, who, who I had known slightly and whose work I really admired. And then they together got Sir Sharona. I got to go to the Academy Awards, but if you're a novelist at the Academy Awards, no one has really any interest in you. They put me sitting at the back I went to a few parties, but I, I'm too old and I'm out of things. So I didn't know, I honestly didn't know who Lady Gaga was. I knew there was someone making a big fuss, but I couldn't think who it was. And I asked somebody, and that's Lady Gaga. And I may or may not have passed Elton John. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. But the big, the big occasion, the big business was that the film opened in Enniscorthy. They had two screenings and we all dressed up and we looked much better. I mean, people in Enniscorthy looked much better than anyone looked in Hollywood. And I was in both places and I can judge. <laughs> 
Um, we have to go on now, of course, to The Magician. And it is about the story of Thomas Mann. And I believe you've been working on this since 2005, was it? And a very interesting, complex character. Yeah, I was in I was in Los Angeles the first time, 2005. And the one thing I wanted to do was to get into the house where Thomas Mann, which Thomas Mann had built as an exile from Hitler in 1942. So I started to imagine this life. He was born in 1875. Um, he, he published a first novel when he, when he was 25 called Buddenbrooks. And it made him famous and it made him a lot of money. And um, he married a very rich um, and cultured woman. Together they had six children. But he also was, I think, secretly, quietly homosexual. Katiga's family was Jewish. And therefore they really were at risk. Uh, and their six children were at risk of his job. And it happens in my book is to get those six children out of Germany, out of Europe and into America to, to get them safe. He, he then moves west, he moves to California, where a lot of the German exiles moved, just waiting for the war to be over and realizing, of course, that things became much worse. And for th those people later feeling they had been exiled in paradise with their palm trees and their beautiful frangy pani plants and stuff, while at home in their own country, you know, the most, I suppose, murderous, uh, you know, things were going on. So it's something that Thomas Mann had to try and write about and think about. He became, I suppose, with Einstein, the most famous German alive, but, but, and he became close to President Roosevelt because he needed to know from a German that he could trust how this had happened and how Germany could be, in, in a way, rescued at the end of the war. Sounds absolutely compelling. A writer writing about a writer. Um, looking behind you, of course, we can see an absolutely incredible collection of books. Could you pick out or even tell us which is maybe your most sacred book? <laughs> um, well, I suppose, um, you, know, you know, I've been working um, on this Thomas Mann material and there's a short little book called Unwritten Memories by Thomas Mann's wife, Katia. This, this book re really makes clear how much of Thomas Mann's own writing was not necessarily autobiographical as much as based on things that happened. Mm. But she, she writes a very clear account of what their lives were like and who they met and where they went. And uh, I found it a very useful book when I was writing my own book. So that, so that book, yeah, that's a good book. And um, um, well, we could keep going on. I mean, um, let me see what else is here. Oh, I'll tell you what's really good. If you're really looking for a good book, this is a book called Dreamers. And um, it's an account of the extraordinary revolution that took place in Munich in 1919. I mean, these guys were really serious revolutionaries and they ran the city for a brief period. And this book just describes, it's almost comic. And, but, it, but it really shows, if you're interested in Irish history, that this idea of a dreamer with a gun was not just an Irish idea. The um, Germans, of course, were more sensible that they didn't actually shoot the leaders. They put them in prison and they eventually got out. And of course, um, but when Hitler came to power, he really had it in for the people who ran the revolution. Can you talk to us about the first book that maybe you remember reading or that was read to you? I, I didn't really read when I was young. Um, I mean, before I just did, I would st start a book, but I, I just couldn't get into its world. And uh, I think I started really with Ag getting really interested in reading with Agatha Christie. And uh, I found those books absolutely intriguing because I could never guess who did it. I was always fooled. <laughs> I always thought the vicar did it when in fact it was the gardener. What about yourself becoming a writer? And, you know, can you bring us back to when you decided this is what I want to do as a career? I think the business of being a writer and becoming a writer is a bit grandiose, it's a bit large. Often you're just writing a book and then some days you're doing nothing. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of concerted work. You really have to concentrate. And I'm not good at that. I mean, I'm sort of a drifter, a dream, I'm a chancer. You know, I try things, but I did actually finish that book. And uh, so I, then I finished all these other ones. So well, there's nothing else I can do now, of course. <laughs> and I'm at retirement age, it was just strange because I don't really want to retire from this novel writing business because I've been doing it now and I'm sort of used to it. Luckily, there's no mandatory retire, or maybe unluckily, there's no, for, you know, <laughs> no mandatory retirement for us, for novels. Colm Tobin, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you and uh, it's been great to learn all about your life as a writer and of course, living all over the world. So uh, I have to say, Sloan from Ireland and uh, we look forward to seeing you back here soon. Okay, thank you very much. Great to talk to you. 
absolutely incredible there from Cullum Tobin and what an absolute literary genius. Jamie, want to know what do you think is his greatest piece of work? Oh, just one, like all of them. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I love The Master. I mean, Brooklyn as well, as I said, I love no sad ending in a book. So Brooklyn for me is just like ideal. Another like, you know, remains the day situation. But like The Master just, I think as a writer, it's a book about a writer, it's about Henry James. So yeah. it was kind of an insight into Henry James. But I'm like, it's also an insight into maybe how Colm Tobin writes as well. Because I think obviously he brings something of himself to the book. Just a stunning book, stunning book. I actually use this section out of it when I do a bit of teaching. So it's oh. so, so good. Oh. And he short stories as well of The Empty Family. Ah, oh, great collection. He is, he's amazing. I love how he said there, he's a, um, a writer, but he doesn't read. <laughs> there you go. Um, is he Neil Tobin's brother? <laughs> no, no, okay. I'm just saying no. surname. Okay. <laughs> what I really want to know, Megan, yep. what's the story? What's your favourite book? My favourite book? Mm. Oh! Wow. <laughs> of all time? Yeah. Wow, okay. Well, I have to say, I think Dr. Seuss was the first book that was ever read to me, so that's always going to have a special place. And I think Harry Potter is just magical as well, and it's kind of the first book that really brought me into that wizardry and, and magic world. So, uh, yeah, but I think Dr. Seuss will always have that special place in my heart. Well, the Harry time. Potter side go back to once every two or three years, a cold Christmas day and just uh, talk about, or even the films, all of it. <laughs> People are like, are you the film or are you the book? And I'm like, all of it. And Amazing. I am clearly not a millennial because I have never read <laughs> Harry Potter, but I feel I will be reading it a lot in the future as I have a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. So my future is paved with Harry Potter books, I feel, <laughs> in the future. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got one over your shoulder there, so you never know. I might let you take it home with you. <laughs> <laughs> And that wraps up our October episode of What's the Story? A massive thank you to our guests, our wonderful Trina McCarthy, Jamie O'Connell and Cullum Tobin. We'll be back again next month. Hope you find time to read something like Jamie says, even if it's just a few pages a day, our war and peace. Whatever it is, enjoy it. Happy reading and let us know what you think by tweeting using the hashtag What's the Story? We'll see you back here next month.